chains the sword. Their lies for Christ is The existence of his son. Those long made content and just sin
right, good evening. Good to see you this evening. Hope you had a nice afternoon this 4th of July weekend and enjoyed the time uh, with family maybe, but uh, boy, it was a beautiful day again. I'm looking forward to another one tomorrow to celebrate the, the national holiday and uh, had good service this morning. Looking forward to getting to the Word of God again tonight. Looking forward to doing some singing, worship the Lord together, and I left my sheet over there. Where are we starting today, brother? Page 579. Page 579. Let's stand together and sing it out. Page 579. All right, 579, the banner of the cross. Shall we stand? There's a royal banner given for display to the soldiers of the king. And an ensign fair we lift it up today while the ransomed one will sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ counts everything but lost. And to crown him king, oil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. Though the maids may rage and gather as a flood, let the standard be displayed. And beneath this fold, as soldiers of the Lord, for the truth be not dismayed. Marching on, marching on, for Christ knows everything but lost, and to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. Over land and sea, wherever men may dwell, make the glorious Tidings known of the crimson banner. Now the story tell, for the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on, marching on, for Christ knows everything but lost, and to crown him king, oil and sing. Neath the banner of the cross. When the glory dawn is drawing very near, it is hasting day by day. Then before our King, the foe shall disappear, and the cross the world shall sway. Marching on, marching on, for Christ knows everything but lost, and to crown him king, toil and sing, neath the banner of the cross. Brother Bill Dublin, would you open us in prayer? Amen. You may be seated, Roy. All right. Some reminders from this morning's uh, announcements. We have the uh, new nursery schedules are out in the foyer. Uh, at this point, though, we have pretty much uh, the same schedule every week, so it's pretty easy to keep track of, um, but we do try to update them every month. And those are out there. And then uh, this Tuesday, 6 to 8 o'clock at the church will be the next Young Adult Bible Study meeting. And um, so if you know somebody in that age group, feel free to welcome them or invite them. And uh, Thursday at six from 6 to 8 is the Vacation Bible School prep. Uh, this will be the first meeting. We'll get some things uh, squared away, get some, some plans made and 
uh, maybe start getting some decorations made. And then the coming weeks on Thursday at, from 6 to 8 p.m. every week in July, we'll be pre preparing things, whatever we can prepare, so that uh, come VBS time we'll be fully ready. And that is the 1st through the 5th of August this year, Monday through Friday, the first week of August. And uh, Neighborhood Bible Time is going to be coming and uh, joining us and helping run the show this year. And so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Saturday at 9 a.m. is Ladies' Prayer Breakfast. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, and uh, that'll be the first uh, official meal time that we're having over back in that room again. And uh, I forgot to make mention this morning. Uh, I mentioned it on Wednesday night, and then I forgot this morning to announce uh, to remind everybody. I believe uh, I believe the date. Let me look at my calendar here. Is um, uh, the 28th? Let's see, July 24th is uh, when we're going to have our summer. Uh, fellowship dinner uh, after the Sunday morning service. So that's going to be uh, a few weeks away from here, from now, and that'll be July 24th. We'll have a big meal uh, out there. We'll probably have some different yard games and stuff set up if anybody wants to stay in fellowship a little, but uh, we're looking forward to that. That'll be a good, uh, be good to be able to get back in that room and spend some time fellowshipping over some food. Amen to that. But uh, we, um, that's about it for the announcements right now. We don't have uh, we we have a lot going on, but you're all fully aware of it. And if you have any questions about any of it, please let me know. And uh, hope to uh, hope to see some fruit from from the efforts that we made yesterday. And the Lord blesses. Uh, the Lord does bless. We don't. We may never know uh, those tracks. You. It's the wonderful thing about those Bible tracks. You may never have any idea how much effect it has. Just like telling your neighbor about the Lord, you never know that seed planted could go so far. And uh, there were several hundred seeds planted yesterday. So be praying about that. Continue to pray for those John and Romans that we were able to put together here a few weeks ago. They're on their way to Germany or there now. And, and we don't have any new update about that. Just be praying. All these things are little seeds going out into that world. And we're just praying that they'll hit that fertile ground and somebody will come to know Christ as their Savior. And it'll be worth every ounce of effort we put forth. All right. Well, let's turn in our hymn books to page number 573. A uh, song that says exactly what's the, what we are, onward Christian soldier. Uh, we ought to be in the fight for the Lord, not just sitting on the sidelines. Ought to be praying, ought to be working, ought to be doing all we can uh, in this battle for souls. Page 573. All right, 573, it's our greeting song. So you want to stand again? Onward, Christian soldiers, marching after war, with the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the royal master leads against the foe. Forward into battle, see his banner go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before. At the sign of triumph, Satan spoke the flee. On then, Christian soldiers, on to victory. Hell's foundation quiver at the shout of praise. Brothers, lift your voices, loud your anthem praise. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Greet one another. So we'll have you sing this song right after this.
Okay, let's continue on. Verse 3, 573. Like a, like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are dreading with the saints have brought. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and suffering, one in clarity. <coughs> Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Onward, many people join our happy throng, blend with our joy voices. In the triumph song, glory, Lord, and honor unto Christ the King. This through countless ages, men and angels see. Onward, Christian. Soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. You may be seated. Brother Pete's going to come to receive the evening offering. And I will ask the blessing for. All right. Thank you, Lord, again for the good services we've had today. Thank you, Lord, for America and for what it stands for. And Lord, though we know we're not an imperfect nation and we're not imperfect people, but Lord, you have had your hand of blessing upon our nation from the beginning, and we thank you. And Lord, we pray that these forces of evil that are out there that would like to... Uh, deny that God had any part in our founding and turn us away from our mooring. Defeat them, Lord, and we give you the thanks and praise for the money you've sent in tonight to help us. Sending of the gospel round about the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Adeline's going to sing for us a little bit tonight.
test and see how loud it is. Say hello. Hello. <laughs> That's good. I just didn't want it to be too loud. Right, right, right. Yeah. Roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden on my heart, roll away. Roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden on my heart, roll away. Every sin had to go beneath the crimson flow. Hallelujah, roll away, roll away, roll away. Every burden on my heart, roll away. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. All right, it did not seem that long ago that that little girl was a little girl. And now, just standing on a chair, she looks one of us, and in a very short time, she's not even going to need a chair. Thank you, Adeline, that was great. Two great songs. Thank you so much. All right, number 570. Faith is a victory. 570. <laughs> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing sky. Against the foe in veils below, let all our might be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph drawn. By faith they light, a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all heard about. The earth shall tremble beneath the tread, and echo is our shout. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory, that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then upward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night, in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory 
that overcomes the world. As we were singing that song, I don't know how many folks here get uh, channel 265 on TV with the Dish Network, but there's a channel there that has Christian news. It's called Victory News. And they close every session by saying those words exactly about faith is a victory. We shall overcome by faith. And then they pray. And it's news with a Christian uh, flair. I know that the company or the, uh, shall we say, uh, Christian network that's behind it is not exactly our flavor. Uh, they believe a little bit more in the healing and things like that. But uh, that news is refreshing compared to what the news that we normally listen to. So if you can get channel 265, I highly recommend. It's on at the noon, 5, and 9 at night. And it's not always on at 9 at night. It's like it's two nights a week that it's not on. But uh, it's definitely refreshing to listen to news from a Christian perspective. And you think someday in heaven, I wonder if there'll be any uh, radio stations or anything, but you know whatever you hear up there is going to be honoring to God. And uh, I was just thinking today, I don't know if anybody drove down the street of Slippery Rock, uh, but uh, I was thinking of the pastor saying that they were across from the uh, bar there, whatever they call it, uh, some hill or something, Ginger Hill, I think it's called. Today, as we drove down by, you know, there was a group of college students there, and uh, I don't know what they were protesting or announcing or whatever, but they're all gathered around there with signs. I assumed, just assumed, that it was something to do with the abortion thing, the abortion case. But there was maybe a dozen or 15 kids, and I think, how sad that you kids are so misled. And I'm sure your leadership from the school over here is pushing them in that direction. But uh, right on the streets of Slippery Rock and out in Podink Town, nowhere, here we are with adversaries of, of uh, the truth and uh, trying to get their message out. But we're free. Us as Christians, we are free. Not only are we free as a nation, thank you, Lord, but we're free in many other ways. This song talks about it. We were once totally enslaved by the world and its greed. And uh, we're, we're now, we've escaped from the prison, which was opened by love for the ransom that was paid for us to get out. So long I had searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and its greed Then the door of my prison was opened by love for the ransom of sin was then paid. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of the past. For I've traded my shackles for a glorious song. I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. I am free from the guilt that I carry from the dull empty life I'm set free for when I met Jesus he made me complete he forgot the foolish man I used to be I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free 
from the guilt of the past. For a freed in my shackles, for a glorious song, I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. For a trade in my shackles, for a glorious song, I'm free, praise the Lord, free at last. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ken. It's a good song, good message. Created my shackles. That's good. All right. Exodus chapter number 10 is where we're going to find ourselves this evening. Exodus chapter number 10. We are cruising along through these 10 plagues, and uh, before you know it, we'll be wrapping them up. And we've got a whole lot more of the book of Exodus to go. I feel like a lot of people, they remember the 10 plagues, and then after that, it's just like, well, that's some other things happened in Exodus, but. Don't don't recall, you know, and there's because their ten plagues stand out so much for such a such a clear and obvious display of God's power, and uh, so it's easy to remember things like that. But there's a lot that happens in the book of Exodus, and we're excited to go through the whole thing together. And uh, we are we are Exodus chapter ten, and we'll start with verse seven. We'll read a few verses this evening, and then we'll pray. Uh, we'll get into the Bible, see what the Lord has for us. Exodus chapter ten, and verse number seven. The Bible says, And Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? We talked about this last time we were together. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go, serve the Lord your God. But who are they that shall go? Moses said, We will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds. We will go. For we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them, Let the Lord be with you, uh, so with you as I will let you go. And, uh, and your little ones, look to it, for evil is before you, not so. Go now, that ye, uh, ye that are men, and serve the Lord, for that ye did desire. And they were driven from Pharaoh's, uh, out from Pharaoh's presence. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Pray, please help us now as we. Seek to study it together for the time that we have. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we have Pharaoh here. Pharaoh and the Egyptians, they've suffered through at this point several plagues uh, that God has sent to destroy the land, to punish the people, and to judge the false gods of the Egyptians. We've looked at that in previous sermons. Their nation is devastated in every possible way because they refuse to let Israel go. And God is, God is making it this way so that He can punish Israel and judge their gods and so that His name will be known throughout the whole world. Uh, God has done some things up to this point in history that obviously affected the whole world. You think about the flood. You think about the Tower of Babel and different things like that. But uh, He is specifically seeking, one of the verses that we've studied already, He's specifically seeking that His name be Uh, known and his power be known throughout the whole earth because of what he's doing in Egypt and uh, and he surely surely accomplishes that when we'll see when they the children of Israel by the time they get uh, 40 years later by the time they get to Jericho the people of Jericho are terrified of the Israelites and they're gone because they heard what happened to Egypt and that's 40 years removed and and so it's just amazing thing that God does here now Moses again and again has said to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord. Uh, the message has not changed, and it's, and it's essentially the Word of God. It's, it may be one message for one uh, man in one point in time, but it is, Thus saith the Lord. And that's what we need to preach still today, is Thus saith the Lord. And that's what we need to respond to still today, is Thus saith the Lord. Not Thus saith the pastor, not Thus saith the feelings, not Thus saith the culture, but Thus saith the Lord. And uh, Pharaoh refuses to listen to the Lord. Now, it seems fitting as we study through Exodus as a church uh, that we come to this passage that talks about the children uh, just days or, or a week or so after the, the overturning of Roe versus Wade in, in our nation. And so, of course, as American 
Uh, that is a huge milestone in our nation's history. Obviously, it, it doesn't do as much as we would love it to do. We would love it to have been a ban on abortion like all the crazies think it is, but it's not. It just returns it to the people to do the voting to make, uh, make their voices heard and make it uh, allowable for states to make their own legislation about it. But it's a victory nonetheless and a victory that people have been praying for since before I was alive. And uh, so that, that's a huge answer to prayer, and Lord willing that uh, more and more will come of that. And uh, there's other other things. We had a, another victory the same day and uh, got kind of overshadowed by Roe v. Wade, but the, the football coach that was fired for praying on the football field, I did that in public school. We, we had we had prayer on the field all the time, and, and we never, never even had a complaint, even though I went to a public school that wasn't necessarily a, a holy place. <laughs> I don't know that any of them are. But, um, but it was a, a, yet another victory for religious freedom and, uh, and then another victory for those of us who don't like the, the three-letter agencies came later on, if you know what I'm talking about there with the EPA. But so uh, the, Lord, the Lord's doing, blessing us in so many ways, even still today in America. And, and I believe that if we'll keep praying and we'll keep doing our best to serve God, we could see some good things, some more good things happen, especially in this abortion thing. And, and the reason I mention all that is because we get to this passage, and this is, a, a, I'd say, a somewhat famous verse, a somewhat well-known passage that preachers will, will draw to when they speak about children because he says, we're going we're gonna to take our children, we're going to go with our children, our young and our old. Uh, we will go with our young. And, and I think that's important because Pharaoh, what Pharaoh is asking, you think about how insane this sounds to everybody but Pharaoh, because what Pharaoh is asking Moses to do, he says, you and the men go worship. Well, where, they do, where do they want to go? They want to go three days journey into the wilderness. So they're going to go three days journey into the wilderness to hold a feast to God that they don't know how long it's going to be or exactly what he's going to want from them. And so they're going to be out there for who knows how long and leave their wives and children in the, in the hands of a nation that just years prior ordered the slaughter of all male children. That's not, that's not a deal that any sane person would take. That's not a deal that any man would ever even consider. And thank the Lord, Moses does not consider that. He says, we're going to go with our young. We're going to go with our old. We're going to go with our daughters and our sons and our cat. We're going to go with everything we have because we don't know what God wants us to do out there in order to have that feast unto him. And, and frankly, I don't think anybody in their right mind would have trusted the Egyptians enough to leave their family there. Uh, I have a hard time sometimes leaving my family at home. You know, you leave the house and sometimes you get that gut feeling like, oh man, I feel like just something's, I'm, something's missing or I forgot to do something. And, and I'm always, you know, I, I'm that guy that I, I trust the Lord. I love the Lord, but I keep my gun and I lock my doors. And, uh, and it's just, you know, and I, I would never, I would never want to leave my family somewhere in the hands or in the uh, control of a people that were like the Egyptians. The Egyptians worshipped false gods. The Egyptians uh, slaughtered children. The Egyptians sound a lot like Americans today, at least some some Americans. And and uh, and so I, I think I think there's lessons to be learned here. And and I see a couple of things. The, the reminder, first and foremost, to me as a father and as a man, the reminder is to that God intends for us to protect and provide and care for our families. And that's still the way it's supposed to be. Now, obviously, if the man is no longer around, if the husband dies or the father runs off, obviously, yes, the mother steps up and she does what she has to do. But the God-designed way, the God-ordained way, is a husband and a wife raising a family together till death do they part. And, and that is the right way. That's God's way, and that is the best way. Even if you were to talk to somebody who did not know God, did not care a thing for God, just looking at statistics of, of what has happened over the years, they know that's the way. And, and for men, uh, it's, a, it's a high responsibility. Of course, it's a high responsibility for the ladies as well, but uh, we are charged with that responsibility of provision and protection. And we go to 1 Timothy 5 and Ephesians 6 in our Bibles. 1 Timothy 5 and Ephesians 6. Uh, we'll grab a couple of verses here. Of course, 1 Timothy 5, you, you might already know uh, off, offhand. We've, we've referred to it several times over the past year, but um, always good to go back. Always good to remind ourselves of these things. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number, uh, let's see, verse number 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, 
and is worse than an infidel. And that provision, we've talked about that before, that provision that's not just financial. I believe that is a spiritual provision, a financial provision. I believe that's a provision of protection. Whatever is needed for the home, if the, if the man does not provide that, the Bible says he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And there's a whole lot of, of nice, godly young ladies out there that, that get to follow in their hearts like, like the world tells them to do, and they end up uh, shacked up with some guy that's a bum, and they don't realize it because he's just their knight in shining denim, and, and they get married, and they have some kids, and they realize too late that this guy's a bum. And he won't work, and he won't do anything. He won't provide, and he won't. And he's too wimpy to protect. And they're just, and they're just stuck. And they're in a, they're in a hard spot. And I feel for those ladies. And that's where, that's where it comes into play. There's so many people want to, want to be mad at us for holding standards, when in reality the, the problem comes before the point at which they get mad at us. You know, they get mad at us for being pro-life, but if they would just if they would just stop fornicating, there wouldn't be a problem. I mean, the problem comes way down the line. And, and people get mad at you for saying that, you know, that a, a husband and a wife should never, you know, should never separate or should never divorce, as the Bible says. And they say, well, the husband's not pulling his weight. It's like, yeah, you had five ladies in the church telling you he was a bum. And you married him anyways. That's not our fault. Our standards don't have to fall just because you made a dumb choice. And, and so... Uh, to get back to the point here, men, we are supposed to be providers. We're supposed to be protectors of our family. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, Bible says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, you can, you can split hairs about how the house is supposed to be run. You can split hairs about, you know, the, the mother is to guide the house and but then the father is supposed to raise them up, and and it's just it's a team effort. It's, it doesn't have to be divided, split in hairs, and all nitpicky. We ought to raise our children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We ought to guide the house. We ought to do these things and not provoke our children to wrath. Proverbs chapter twenty-two will be the last one for this topic. Proverbs chapter twenty-two and verse number six. We see another uh, evidence here of of what us men are supposed to do, what we're supposed to be responsible for concerning our young ones and our wives. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. This is one that you'll probably know by heart. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I, um, I, I got to study in this. Being, you know, being a, young, a younger father, I, I still say I'm a young father, but I mean, I'm in my 30s now and Adeline's 6. I can't believe it. Like you were saying, brother, it's like she just, I was watching her standing there singing, I was like, boy, she barely needs that that chair anymore that's gonna be a sad day for me as a dad when she don't need that chair anymore i'll be like my little girl's pulpit sized but um but i got I, I got to studying out that 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 verse and i was thinking about that word train you know train up a child and and we know the way that we typically use the word train we, we use it in a, in a teaching sense and a instructing you know i'm training a soldier for battle or i'm training somebody to do a job at the job site and that's absolutely correct um but i got to i got to studying it out and that 1828 webster's dictionary there are eight definitions for the word train as a verb there's eight and the one that we use today is number five i thought that'd be like the main definition but it's number five the number one definition of the word train uh, in, in the English language for, of course, 1828 Webster's Dictionary is, uh, is this. It is, um, oh, where's that here? I want to get it right. Uh, it's, oh, yeah, I should be able to get that right. It's two words. To draw along. And then I, so I was like, is that really, is that simple? To draw along. And, and I would study it out, and it is, because that's where we get the word train from, considering the, you know, the choo-choo train, because it draws along the things behind it. And and it's and that's the concept is you're drawing something along and and I, I, whether you believe whatever definition you believe is accurate for for that use of that context of that word I think both of them apply because you think about you're training a child the way you should go that's that's you're teaching them you're con instructing them you're building them up absolutely correct but I think it's also the other definition is just as good you are you're not dragging but you're you're bringing them along. To where they need to be, and and I, 
they've got to be convicting because you think you cannot pull somebody along to somewhere you're not going. And so we think about, we want our kids to be, you know, we want them to have a close walk with God. We want them to be faithful to church. We want them to be faithful to the Bibles and to prayer. And we want them to make all these good choices. And we think, wait a second, they're following me. I'm pulling them along. I'm not, I, I can't just, I can't train my child and pull her along behind me and, and say, yes, look, there's the church. You should go there. Yes, look, there's the Bible. You should read it. And, and meanwhile, I'm pulling her along in a different direction. And, and you see that a lot with, you know, I, I hate to make the generalization, but you see that a lot with like the bus kid families uh, where, you know, the kids will come to church and the parents will be all for it as long as they don't have to go. And it's, it's sad. It's a great thing. The kids come into church and I know preachers that were saved in the bus ministry and it's a wonderful thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to downsize that. I'm just saying it's that mindset of those parents of, you know, somebody else can train my child because the way I'm headed, if they, if they train after me, it's not going to be a good result. That's where you get people. I, you know, as a youth pastor, I didn't face it too much in my church, but as a youth pastor, you always have those parents. They want you to train their kids. They, they, they think that one hour a week at most with the youth pastor and he's got to undo all the junk that you allowed into their life all week. And if they go, they go into the world and they start doing things, they start blaming the church and blaming the youth pastor. It's like, wait a second, whose job is it to train these guys? It ain't mine. It's yours. It's mom and dad's. And so as a dad, you know, it's a convicting thought to think I, I can't expect my daughter or my sons to to show up to a final point that I don't take them to. I can't train them into one direction expecting them to show up somewhere else, to, to end up somewhere else. We can pray to that end and say, do as I say, not as I do, right? That's one of our favorites. Do as I say, not as I do. And, and uh, we're not perfect, but we hope that our children will end up in a white walk with God. We hope that they'll choose Christ. We hope that they'll be faithful, uh, but we have to be reminded that we're training them. They're following our footsteps. They're following behind us. And you, just as a train cannot uh, take its delivery to a different track without going on that track, you cannot uh, expect your child to be anything that you are not. And, uh, and so that's where the hypocrisy and the parenting comes into play. And it's so hard because, again, we're, we're not perfect, but we ought to be heading in a direction that we can be just like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. The Lord is walking this way and I'm walking behind Him and I'm pulling my family this direction and we're all going towards the Lord. That's how it should be. And uh, that's not always how it ends up, but that's how it should be. We should train our children. We should train the young people, the younger generation, do our best to make sure that they are on the right track heading towards the Lord and that uh, we are that example that if they follow our example, where will they end up? Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. Go ahead and turn there with me. This is one of my favorite passages in all of Nehemiah. And uh, Nehemiah is one of my favorite books in all the Bible. It's, um, it's an amazing story in God's Word, the entire, uh, the entire book of the Bible. I heard a preacher one time preach through the book of Nehemiah and, and just some of the things that were in there. You know, it, it's nice to get that perspective sometimes a verse by verse from different people. And, and uh, some of the things he pointed out were amazing. But Nehemiah 4.14 is a verse that, that is very easy to see and to understand the point here. Uh, the enemies have attacked. The enemies have been threatening. And, and Nehemiah has stood at everybody up along. And, and verse 14 says, And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and fight for your brethren, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I like that verse. Because it's Nehemiah telling the people, you're not just fighting for a wall. You're not just fighting for a city. You're not just fighting even for God. You're fighting for your family. And I think that is, is so much more of a motivator. I was never in the military. I didn't have that honor. But, but I have friends who were, and, and I can imagine, and I've talked to people who have gone over and been in combat and different things and come back and and talking about morale and different things like that. And, and I, one of the complaints that has been voiced many times over this last 20-year war that we had on terror was the idea that it was a disconnect of why are we over here? 
You know, and, and the idea that we tried to remind people of and say we're fighting there so we don't have to fight here and, and, and all that, but it was harder, uh, from, from what I've been told, it was harder for some of the men to be motivated to fight with all they had or to serve with all they had because they didn't see the imminent danger to their own. But yet, if, if a nation were to invade our nation, I, I can about guarantee you that there would be some fight in us. There would, be, there would be some men who would stand up and say, I, I wasn't really excited about fighting over there in the dirt and the sand that wasn't ours, but this is my home. This is my family that we're talking about. I am going to fight. It was, I appreciated. I don't remember which one said it first, but, but several of the men that stood up and gave their testimony of service uh, said, I'd do it over again today. And I appreciate that. I do. It's, it's a sad thing that there's so many young people that don't have that attitude or that mindset. They've been spoiled with the, what they've been given with this nation, never had to fight for it, never had to earn it, and I'm one of them. Never had to fight for my freedom, never had to earn it. Nobody I knew directly had to do any of that. Uh, but I'm thankful for those of you who did. And so we ought to be training our children up. We ought to be protecting and providing for our families. Men, we ought to be like Moses and say, all right, enemy, you want my children to be unprotected. You want my children to be under your control but well, I'm going here to serve my God and my kids are coming with me. That's the message. We cannot leave our families into the control of the enemy. And, and before anybody would think in their thought, why, how would that ever happen? It, it's, it's happening every day in almost every Christian home in America when mom and dad give that kid that's far too young for it a cell phone and say, have fun. That thing is connected to everything. And it is a constant struggle nowadays. I mean, these kids are so smart. They're growing up on this technology, and I feel like a dinosaur. My, my, my wife, if she leaves her phone on the counter, little, little Ellie. I mean, she's like three years old, I think. Yeah, three years old. And, and if Michelle has the phone or I have my phone like unlocked, she'll just do, 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 do and we'll, we'll get on there and be like, what are you even on? Oh, she's on Fox News or whatever. You know, she, just, she can just do it. And she understands like the symbols of things. She knows this one gets me to like a, a little kid game. This one gets me to a show or whatever. And, and she knows how to work that stuff. But it terrifies me. Because as much as we do the parental blocking, as much as we do the, you know, all that stuff, you never know. And so we're careful about that. We're careful about the internet. Careful. But there's so many families that you just stick that in front of them and TV trains up the kid. We got, I feel like we got a whole generation of adults now that were trained by their TVs. And boy, how's that turning out for us? <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Never, you never see a functional nuclear family ever in, in those things. And uh, it just, it's just a mess. But, but that's the thing. Is, as parents, especially Christian parents and grandparents, we, we've got to make sure we're doing our best to protect our families and the enemy isn't just some nation that's battering down our walls. It is this subtle attack from the devil. And there's little things that come in. And we got to be watching for those things. We've got to be careful of those things. We've got to be making sure that we are going in the right direction and that we're not allowing the devil to get a foothold. Because as I heard it growing up, and I understand it more today than I ever did, I always heard preachers say, the devil is after your kids. And boy, is that not the truth today. The devil is after those young people because he understands how important they are. Now, I know it's easy to overemphasize youth and forget about everybody else in the church, but, uh, but they truly are an important age group. They're an important category. And, and you know, I, I've said before when I was uh, starting to uh, get my name out there and try to figure out you know, where the Lord would have me to be a pastor, there's churches that I visited and churches that I talked to, and there were so many churches out there that I became aware of that there was about 10 people left and they were all 70, 80 years old. And there was no youth. And it's a sad thing. And, and, it's, and that's the trend in so much of America today is that any church that still has a King James Bible and a hymn book also has a whole lot of gray hair or no hair. And, and there's nothing wrong with gray hair or no hair. That's a, that's a great generation. That's a good thing. And it's a blessing to to live that long and still be in church faithfully serving God. But it's nice to have some young people. The devil's after those young people. And some of you have heartbreak in your own life because you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews who uh, the devil's got them right now. And you're doing your best you can to, to, to help and to, to train and to get them out of that situation. But the devil's after our young people, just like Pharaoh was after uh, the, the 
the weakest of, of, the, of the Israelites. He said, you men leave and leave everything you have here, including your wives and your kids. That's insane. It's insane. But I don't think it'd be going too far to say that, that we often do the same thing in our culture today when we, when we leave our kids unattended and unsupervised with people we don't know that well or with computers connected to the internet. And you just never know what's going to happen. And uh, it's, a, it's a great tool, but it's a dangerous tool. And we ought to be careful. All right, Exodus chapter number uh, 10. We'll go back there again. Uh, concerning children, uh, I think there's no really no way to overemphasize. Uh, you think about what, what the Lord said in Matthew 18. He said, it'd be better if you're going to offend one of these little ones that believes in me, it'd be better than if a millstone was hanged around your neck and you were cast into the sea. And uh, I was joking around with the youth group one, one time years back, and I was like, the Lord Jesus Christ, He invented concrete shoes. He, he gave the mafia that, that, uh, that uh, method there because He said that's, that's what, that would be better. It would be better for you to do that, to have that happen to you than to offend one of these little ones. And I, I think the Lord cares greatly about the little ones, and, and I think we ought to as well. It's a sad thing to me when I see parents that don't care about their kids. And... Uh, I know that's a judgment call. I know that you're not supposed to assume things, but boy, you can sure tell sometimes it seems when you're out in public and the way that a family uh, treats each other. I get everybody has bad days. We do too. But sometimes you just look at the family, you just feel for them kids. We were, we were at the park over at um, Lake Arthur the other day, a couple weeks ago, and, and this car went by and they're just, the car is thumping this vulgar music, swearing and, and the car's full of smoke, and it didn't smell like normal tobacco smoke. And, and there's two adults in the car, and there's two little kids in the back seat. Hearing all that junk, taking all that stuff in, and I'm just thinking, Lord, help them. I mean, that's disgusting. But that's, that's the state of so many families. And so we got to be protective of our children. We got to uh, make sure that our kids, uh, our kids are going with us and that we're going on the right track. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll continue on from that. Now, Exodus chapter 10 and verse number 12. Let me get there myself. Exodus 10, 12. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, uh, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. Now, they were given the warning. Pharaoh was given the warning. You're going to get these locusts if you don't me- if you stop, stop messing around. He said, Okay, well, you can go, but who's going to go with you? He said, We're going to take everybody. He says, Never mind, and kicks him out. And he says, Okay, time for the locusts. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is so gracious. We don't deserve heaven, and, and Pharaoh didn't deserve a warning. Uh, but he gave him, gave him so many warnings and so many chances and opportunities. Verse 13, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them were no such locusts as they neither after them shall be such. Now, I, I think it's interesting the way that's worded. Uh, it, it doesn't even really say that there were none as many as they said. So these were some peculiar locusts, it sounds like. There were no locusts like them before, and there'd be no locusts like them after. I think that's interesting. Verse 15, For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left, And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. That's that's insane. The whole nation, nothing green. Now you picture Pennsylvania. Now I know Pennsylvania's probably got more green than Egypt has ever had because because of the way we are and the way they are. But um, but can you imagine uh, the fiery hail, the the bloody water, all the different things that have happened, and and then the locusts come through and they're the cleanup crew and they just wipe it clean and there's nothing green. Now we see that every winter, uh, except for the evergreen trees, you know, the pine trees and stuff. But, but can you imagine to see where it's just been wiped out? I've seen some, some fields where bugs have really gone in and, and just wiped out a lot of stuff, but I can't imagine a whole nation with nothing green. Now I'd say, praise the Lord, no more salads, but, um, but that's just me. That's a big problem. They've got no more cattle. Their cattle's been killed twice. <laughs> so they they got very little cattle left in the, in the land. They've, they've, got, uh, they've had to dig wells for new water. 
They, they've had all these troubles. They've had boils on their bodies. They've had lice and flies and frogs and now locusts, and their land is just decimated. And so we come to uh, verse number, let's see, verse, uh, verse number 16, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once. And entreat the Lord your God that He may take away from me this death only. It sounds familiar that that prayer of it's just just this one time, Lord. I just you know just need this one thing, Lord. <laughs> Verse eighteen. He went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt. Now. I think here we have a, a bit of a reminder of even though even though obviously the Lord is not done with Pharaoh and he's not done with Egypt and this is a very peculiar situation, it it just reminds me of the effectiveness of repentance. Because over and over again, whenever Pharaoh says, I've done wrong, please forgive me, entreat the Lord for me. Time and time again, Pharaoh goes to Moses and says, please get these locusts away. Please get these frogs away. And you know what God does every single time? He answers that prayer. He answers that call for help every single time. And in the case of the frogs, it was like, okay, when do you want it? Tomorrow. That's so weird. We talked about that already. But, but the Lord, as soon as it was asked for, as soon as it was desired, He brought that. Whenever there was repentance. Now, true repentance, of course, is, is to uh, not just ask for forgiveness, but to change your behavior afterwards and to not, no longer go back to that uh, the best you can. That's true repentance, so it's not a very great use of the word on my case there. But, uh, but to asking forgiveness, you see, you think about 1 John 1.9, uh, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a verse written to saved individuals. Uh, people use it as a salvation verse, and that's fine, but, but it's, its context is for the saved. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This, this Pharaoh, he, he does this, and I, I think it's great to see that even though Pharaoh obviously has this, this whole different, unique situation going on with Egypt and with the punishment from God and God's plan here, uh, God still, again and again, they, he could have let those locusts go for a week. He could have let the bloody water go for a month. He could have done all these things for much longer. But as soon as there was a cry for help, God stopped each plague. And, and, and who knows? He, he could have gone on and made them suffer really long. But he didn't. He, he stopped those plagues so often right when they were asked for. And, uh, and though that happened... I think it also shows a very good reminder of the lasting effects of our sin. Because yes, Pharaoh said, forgive me just this once. Please take away these locusts. And God said, okay, no more locusts. But then what did Pharaoh do? Again, hardened heart. God comes in. All right, now the darkness. And then beyond that, the death of the firstborn. And the locusts may have been gone, but the green didn't come back. At least not right away. The, the bloody river left and the frogs left and the flies left, but the damage that they did remained. And, and people, I think sometimes we get this, this false idea that if I ask forgiveness, God will forgive me and He'll just wipe away all the consequences. And sometimes the Lord, I truly believe, does work things out that way as a blessing and He just saves, spares us from so much that we could endure because of our sin. If we even knew how much God spared us from on a day-to-day -day basis, that every little thing that we do that is a sin that could have consequences, and I believe, I believe wholeheartedly there's plenty of times in my life where the Lord said, all right, you sinned, you did this wrong, and it could cost you this, but I'm not going to let it cost you that much. And I think God has done that for me. It's a blessing in my life. Uh, I'd much rather just not sin and not have the consequences, but that sin, even when God has forgiven us, it does leave scars. It does leave consequences. And, and I, got, I got a little interested in today. I know we're about out of time, but I, I looked up. I was curious about the phrase when Pharaoh said, I have sinned. And I got to thinking about who else said that in the Bible. And it really was a kind of a perplexing study because 
You have a mixture of people who make that statement in the Bible. You have Balaam after his, uh, after his donkey refuses to move and he beats his donkey and then all of a sudden he sees that angel of death and he says, oh, I've sinned. I didn't know you were there. <laughs> and, and so you have Balaam and then you have, uh, you have Achan. Achan who took the gold and the garments, the Babylonian garment, and hid him in his tent and caused the, the death that happened to Ai because of his sin and taking things from Jericho when he wasn't supposed to. And, and he, he said, I have sinned. And, and, uh, and then uh, Saul... Saul multiple times, I believe he's the only one that more than one time said, I have sinned. He did things wrong. And, and uh, then uh, David, when confronted concerning Bathsheba, said, I have sinned. Uh, Job, Job was one that makes the statement, I have sinned, even though the Lord said that in the, in the con- situation of what had happened, that, he, uh, that Job sinned not, neither gar- charged God foolishly, but that doesn't mean he never sinned. And Job understood, I'm a sinner, I have sinned. Shimei, uh, if you remember, Shimei is the man who uh, ran down to the banks of the river as, as uh, David was fleeing Absalom's rule and he was cursing David. Well, he came and, and when David came back to the city, he sought David out and said, forgive me, I, I have sinned. Shimei was one and then uh, uh, Job and, and, and David and Saul and Achan and Balaam. And uh, we have the, the the prodigal son said it, but I didn't include him. Uh, and, and then Judas Iscariot. Uh, you remember he went back to those priests and he cast the money at their feet and said, I've sinned. I've, I've betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, oh, we don't care. What's it to us? He went and hanged himself. And so there's kind of a mixture here because we see some kind of some villains of the Bible who make the claim I have sinned, like Balaam and, and Saul. And, and then we see some heroes of the Bible like like Job and David. And, and so the, the point is, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We see that. But it's interesting to me, you think about you know, the, these effects of sin and things, uh, the, the, way that, the way that their sins affected them in their lives, those that, uh, that made the claim, I have sinned, before they were ever confronted with their sin, things seemed to go better for them. Shimei was spared when he sought out David and claimed he had, that he had sinned and asked forgiveness. Job was, was rewarded by God for going through what he went through, even though he had, was a sinner, of course, because um, he freely offered up that he, had, that he had sinned. David had to be told that he had sinned. He had to be confronted by Nathan the prophet. And because of that, the sword never departed from his house. Saul had to be told several times that he had sinned by Samuel. And because of that, the kingdom was taken from him. Achan had to be discovered. And then he finally, oh yeah, I guess I did it. <laughs> and he was killed. And so I think it's interesting to, to see, that, uh, see that that statement, you know, not just everybody that made that statement made it correctly. I guess you could say the correct way is to say it and come out with it before you're discovered. Uh, to 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 know that God sees all and knows knows your sin before you even admit it, and to just say, you know what, I did it wrong. I, that was me, <laughs> and to not wait until they've divided you up by families and then divided it further and then got down and it's just Aiken's tent left. You don't want to go that route. Now, the uh, that that's another sermon for another day. But the effects of sin on the lives of those who have sinned. Uh, even just here in in Egypt, the, the sin that they have, this this oppression of God's people and this hardening of the heart and this refusal to obey God's word, it just leaves scars and it causes harm and pain even after the respite comes from each plague. You think about Galatians 6-7, that, that God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And it's just so true. Um, it, it may seem a simple thing to finish on, but I think we ought to be always reminding ourselves that sin, even after God forgives us for it, does have an effect not just on us, but on others. The penalty for sin has been paid, but the effect remains. Broken homes, broken families, lost jobs, lost opportunities, lifelong scars. The plague of locusts is a reminder of the importance of protecting the children and and doing our duty as fathers and as as husbands. And, And Pharaoh's repentance is a reminder, praise the Lord, of God's grace. Obviously, in Pharaoh's case, he did not he did not repent, but he he asked for that forgiveness, and God God took away the locusts, God took away the flies, God took away the frogs, even though Pharaoh didn't deserve that. And so often we ask for forgiveness, and He forgives us and forgets it, and we don't deserve that. 
And then uh, Pharaoh's continued defiance is that warning against those effects of sin because they do pile up. That nation of Israel is a good example, a good correlation, I think. You, you think about somebody who, who has lived most of their life, maybe they were blessed enough to be born into a Christian home and they never really got into really, you know, that deep, dark place in life. They, they never did the drugs, they never did the alcohol, they, ne- they never fornicated, they never did all that stuff. They, they lived a pretty clean life. There are not a whole lot of scars there. There's still sin. We're all still sinners. They still have pride or whatever it may be. And, and that can still cause plenty of problems. But, but you look at that life and you look at the life of somebody who lives just in the gutters all their life and serving the devil and serving the flesh all their life. And, and they'd probably be the first to tell you that at the end, yeah, there's some scars. There's some things that remain. There's some, some sorrows that, that still come up every now and then because of reaping what has been sown and it's just a reminder, you look at Israel, the, the nation and the people just got worse and worse and worse the more they refused to let Israel go. And the first one's pretty bad, the bloody water. But in a river, that water flows, that water gets washed away after a while. And after a week, the, the bloody river returned to normal and they had dug some new, the new wells and they said, all right, well, we're fine now. And then the frogs came and Oh, Lord, get these frogs away. And they left. Oh, well, we're fine now. And the flies and the lice and, and the locusts and, and the darkness and all these things. And by the end of it all, the nation of Egypt and the people are just spent. And some people, you can look at their lives and you can see where it's a miracle. They're still around. God has protected them and God has blessed them. And they're so much better off now that they're saved. But there's some scars and there's some inward scars and there's some memories that just won't go away because of that time they spent rejecting God. And uh, so we ought to be careful. Now, those of us who have been blessed, like I have been blessed to be raised in a Christian home, be raised in a good church, to, to have a good foundation and never never go into the alcohol or the drugs or the fornication or any of that stuff, uh, we, we ought to understand that we don't know how bad that really is, but that it's worth keeping people away from it and uh, letting people know. I mean, we, we used to joke as youth pastors, uh, I'll just tell you this and I'll be done, but we used to joke as youth pastors, you know, we, we'd go to youth conferences and big rallies and stuff sometimes, and, and a lot of us local guys would end up at the same place as different areas of the state. And uh, there were certain youth rallies where they always had the guy in that had that, had that testimony. You know, I was, I was a drug dealer and I, you know, or I, I did this or I did that and all that, that, all that craziness. And then God saved me because it's like the Saul to Paul. It's that big transformation and people like to see that. And, and it's an amazing story. But we used to joke together as youth pastors. We'd be like, man, I wish I'd have done drugs. Because it's just like, wow, I got a boring testimony. You know, I, I never, I never, I didn't, you know, when I got saved, I got, praise God, I got saved. But it wasn't like, oh, you know, he's in the gutter and he got saved. Woo-hoo. It was like, oh, yeah, he went to church and he got saved. And we'd joke around, man, I wish I did drugs. Oh, I wish I did. And, and of course, it was all in good fun. We were just kidding around. But but you understand the concept there. You know, there's a big, you know, oh, I don't have that big, incredible testimony. But I would always appreciate when those guys that had that testimony, there's one in particular I can think of, he had a testimony that was just would just blow your socks off. And it was just amazing what God brought him from. But he prefaced the testimony and ended the testimony with, this is a bad testimony. He said, he, he, he said you may think this is an exciting testimony, but it wasn't exciting for me. He said it wasn't good for, you may think it's a good testimony, but I'd have much rather had your testimony. He'd point to one of them church kids and say, your testimony is what I want. He said that testimony is, I'd have much rather had that testimony where I didn't get into the drugs and I didn't get into the girls and I didn't get into the alcohol and I didn't go and do this and my friend didn't die of an overdose and all this. He said, you guys might be blessed and might be helped by my testimony, but I sure wish I had your testimony. And so you think about Egypt and all the destruction. I can visualize, you know, I, I try to, vis- I have a very vivid imagination. I can visualize how destroyed the nation became. And it's just because of that re- continued refusal to listen to God. And I look at our nation today and I look at people in our nation today and people in our lives today. And you think about, brother, you just continually reject God and, and look at your life and look at what it's gotten you. And sometimes, sometimes people reject God and everything's just good and dandy all the days of their life, but then they die and go to hell. And we just got to be reminded that, that sin has these consequences, whether, whether here today or, or tomorrow in, in, in the judgment seat, 
there's going to be those consequences of sin, and there's going to be scars, and there's going to be wounds. Even if you get forgiven by God, there's still consequences. And so we ought to be, be that much more careful for, first of all, not to allow ourselves to fall into sin, but to do our best to train people up, bring them behind us, our, our children, our grandchildren, anybody we have an effect on our lives that we can influence and, and let them know it's not worth it to reject God. It's not worth it to go off and have fun in the world. It's not worth it. There's going to be scars. So I remember hearing kids say, why, why if God's going to forgive me anyways, why don't I just go out and do this? And of course, that's a whole series of sermons right there, but but I just tell them because it's not worth it. Because it's gonna be it's gonna leave a scar. Because you're gonna end up like Egypt in the end, and, and, and you're gonna end up destroyed in some way. Something of you is going to be gone that you can't get back. And uh, so we ought to be be careful to make sure that we're doing our best as as adults. We're all adults in here today. Be do, doing our best as adults, parents, grandparents. Uh, to, to make sure that we are training people up behind us, bringing them along behind us in a direction that we ought to be going and making sure they understand that, yes, you may get away with your sin today and you may get away with your sin tomorrow, but that stuff will eat at your soul and you will, you will pay that price someday. God will forgive you and God will forget. and God will, you'll, You won't be punished by God, but that sin sure leaves that mark. Uh, we got to be reminding people of that in, in love and out of care. Uh, reminding them of God's mercy and God's forgiveness. Lord, we thank You for this day. Thank You for Your Word. Help us now as we seek to go our separate ways in a few moments. Lord, help us to go out and be missionaries for You. Lord, help us to go out and, and let people know, Lord, that uh, it is better not to be like Pharaoh. It's better not to reject You, Lord. And it's better to ask forgiveness and truly mean it and stick with it. Uh, Lord, not to just ask forgiveness and go back to a hardened heart. Lord, help us to learn the lesson that Pharaoh did not learn so that we don't have to uh, suffer the consequences of sin in our lives. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Ken. Page 669 in your hymn books. We'll stand together and sing. Page 669. Since the Savior found me. <clears throat> Since the Savior found me, pardoned all my sin, I have had the joy and living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow of the past. You're underneath the precious blood of Christ at last. Save, 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 I'm happy on my way. Save, save, save. I love him more each day. Save, save, save. I know he's mine each hour. He saves and keeps and sanctifies me by his power. Since the Savior found me, <laughs> for his presence has cleansed me white as snow. No, no condemnation. Happy as can be, I'm glad that Jesus justified sets me free. Save, 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 I'm happy on my way. Save, 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 I love him more each day. Save, 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 I know he's mighty tower. He saves and keeps, sanctifies me by his power. Thank you for being here tonight, and uh, good. hope it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I know it went a little long. I didn't know it at the time, but I looked at my, clock, my watch, and I said, I need a clock. But uh, I know some of you were probably thinking that while I was preaching. He needs a clock. But no, I hope it was good to be in the Bible tonight, and I uh, hope you'll go home and get some more of it, another dose of it. And I hope you'll wake up and get some more of it, and uh, just get as much as you can. There's no better thing to do with our time than to be in the Word of God. All right, well, let's uh, pray together and then we'll go our separate ways for a little while. Pray for the, pray for the youth group Tuesday night, uh, those that might meet here at the church. And uh, pray for, uh, we'll be here midweek service for prayer. And then Thursday, we've got a busy month ahead of us, but uh, it'll be, be a blessing 
to see that Vacation Bible School. Be praying now. Start praying now for, for those little kids. Pray that they'll be here. Pray that they'll get saved. Pray that they'll get faithful. Uh, whatever the Lord wants happen from that from that VBS, uh, we just want it to be God's will and God's doing. And so we don't want to get in His way. We want to do our best to be prayed up and ready for it. So I'd appreciate your prayers concerning that and all the different things we got going on. All right, Lord, we thank You for this day. Thank You for Your uh, blessings that You give us. Lord, thank You for these reminders from God's Word of what our duties are as, as fathers, as mothers, as parents, Lord, as Christians. Lord, help us to do our best to, to help to warn others, Lord, of, of the really the, this, the dangers of sin and, Lord, the cost of sin. Lord, help us to show them that there is a better way and help us to be able to say, as Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. Lord, help us to be on that right track and leading and training others up behind us. Lord, we love you. Pray you please be with us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.